previously we discussed national identity. We did so within a context of Canada. We also considered visions for Canada, the number of different visions that have evolved over time. We also talked about the promotion of Canada's national identity and how it's done so, how symbols, institutions, myths, agencies, and other types of uh, programs, government programs, promote Canadian national identity. Let's now go further and let's consider national unity, which is an important topic. It's something that has been uh, very important and in the forefront of, of Canadian affairs and in Canadian history for an extremely long period of time. So let's begin our discussion of national unity within a Canadian context. Well, so what is national unity? Well, basically, it's just a strong sense of belonging to a particular group or collective. And in the case of Canada, it would be a strong sense of belonging to Canada as a nation. And it's something that leads people to feel that they're a part of something, part of a unified whole, whether in, as I mentioned, the case of Canada, a country, or whether it's some other form of group. But it does create and maintain sense of a strong national unity. There's a number of different forces that affect or elements as well that affect national unity and that's certainly been the case uh, for Canada and within history we see a number of different examples. Wars always impact national unity. Quite often they're a, a, a unifying force and sometimes depending on how uh, collectives or nations do they can be quite destructive in regards to unity. National crises also have important impacts and effects as relation to national unity. When countries go through national crises, they can often be a unifying force, and sometimes they can be, as with wars, a destructive force, forces that, uh, as opposed to unify, they, dis, they uh, separate and, and uh, damage unity. There's also internal pressures. Uh, forces such things as groups within a collective, such as minority groups within a country that seek self-determination, these kinds of pressures impact and affect national unity in quite dramatic ways. Geography also is a, an element, a force that affects national unity. Countries that are quite large in nature or even if they are large in nature and are, are sparsely populated often uh, impact national unity in specific ways. Sometimes geographical barriers whether it's mountains or deserts or other items uh, can uh, impact national unity as well. So how about uh, Canadian national unity and how has it been affected by these types of forces? Well, let's consider wars. Well, uh, in the history of Canada, wars have played an enormous role in the development of Canada, its national unity, and it's also led in many ways uh, to uh, being uh, and becoming disunifying forces. World War I and World War II in particular as relates to the development of sovereignty movements in Quebec with the conscription crises in uh, World War I and World War II. And in Canada's involvement in Afghanistan currently is impacting national unity. In many ways it's been a unifying force, but at the present time many questions are being asked as to uh, the reason for Canada's continuous involvement in Afghanistan, and that does impact the national unity of the country. There's been a number of national crises in Canada that have had dramatic impacts on the national unity of the country. The Métis rebellions of 1870, the Northwest rebellions of 1885 uh, had a dramatic impact. They are the beginning elements of Quebec nationalism, and they also led to, as to, became, I should say, unifying forces in both cases, as in the, f the first one led to the idea of, of beginning a transcontinental railway, and the second rebellion became the fait accompli where a transcontinental railway was completed, and they both had dramatic impacts as related to national unity in general. The conscription crises that I mentioned, both of World War I and World War II, uh, were disunifying forces as relates to unity and national unity within Canada, particularly during the war. The FLQ crisis of the early 1970s where a violent separatist group in Quebec kidnapped government officials, one from the province of Quebec and one from England, and while the representative from England was released, the representative and the government official from Quebec was murdered, and this had a dramatic impact on the national unity of the country. The Yoka crisis in relation to 
the uh, First Nations rebellions uh, to such things as land being taken away from them uh, outside of Montreal and the support from other Aboriginal groups across the, the nation and a number of protest groups that uh, protest actions that resulted definitely and dramatically impacted Canada's national unity. So we see that national crises in many ways have enormous uh, impacts on national unity and have had enormous impacts on the national unity of Canada throughout its history. Of course, and obviously internal pressures as well, we've talked about Quebec nationalism. When we talk about groups seeking self-determination, Quebec is probably the foremost example throughout Canada's history. There's been a constant sort of friction and interaction, tension between national unity of Canada and Quebec nationalism and the sovereignty movement within Quebec. Also, Aboriginal self-determination, whether it be in the north with the Inuit and the eventual creation of none of it as a, a province basically made up of Inuit and run by the Inuit people, a land claims within for the within Canada and many in the various provinces, particularly in the west of Canada, in relation to First Nations people, and of course Métis, the Métis people and Métis groups seeking and successfully achieving the recognition of fundamental collective rights for the Métis people. As well, Western alienation, that's happened particularly in Alberta. There's even to this point in time, there is a basically a separatist party within Alberta, the Alberta First Party, which seeks to reduce ties with uh, Eastern Canada, particularly with the federal government. And that's resulted from alienation that people in the West have felt in regards to the federal government and, their, and the input that they think they, they don't have with the federal government. And of course, geography. Geography has probably been a one of the most prominent roles as far as forces that impact Canada and its, and its national unity. Canada is the second largest country in the world, but it only has a population of 30 million people. So the country is very sparsely populated, and it uh, it is uh, a country that uh, has borders with basically one country, the United States, and yet it does also have coastlines with three oceans, the Atlantic, the Arctic, and the Pacific Oceans. And so geography has played a huge role in the development of Canada, excuse me, the development of Canada and in regards to Canadian national unity. Let's continue with our discussion of, of national unity, Canadian national unity. And let's consider some of the uh, specific challenges that Canada has faced and continues to face in regards to its own national unity. We talked about regional alienation. Uh, Western provinces, particularly Alberta, has has faced alienation. Quebec as well has, has experienced a sense of alienation and that's one of the reasons for its sovereignty movements. Even in the Maritimes, particularly with Nova Scotia, there's been alienation. These various regions of Canada have felt that they have not achieved what they thought was their, what they have deserved and, and uh, a sense of equality or parity or uh, basically their interests not being met by uh, their uh, involvement in Canada. And so it, it has created a sense of alienation and this has a tremendous impact on Canada and its national unity and it, the sense of it, regional alienation has been a very, very large challenge to Canada's national unity. We talked about Quebec sovereignty. There have been two referendums, one in the 1970s and the second in the, in the 1990s, where Quebec came very close to separating from Canada and forming its own nation. And Quebec sovereignty and the sovereignty movement continues to be a very great challenge to Canada's unity and to its overall national identity. The whole idea of equality and fairness within the federal system, something that we touched upon just a few moments ago when we talked about the regional alienation of the western provinces, Quebec and, and Nova Scotia, that's played an extremely large role in the evolution of Canada and its, in its national identity. And it's a very, very great challenge. There are many groups such as individuals in Alberta who feel that Alberta is not properly represented, that because of the population advantage of Eastern Canada, particularly Quebec and Ontario, that the interests and, and beliefs of the West are not fairly represented or, or supported. They feel that political representation is not uh, equivalent, and uh, many such groups 
have pushed for an effective, what they call a triple E Senate, effective, equal, and elected. And then there's other contentious issues in regards to equality and fairness for such things as equalization payments. Two provinces in particular, uh, Ontario and Alberta, contribute money that goes to other provinces to equal um, revenue going there so that federal programs can be maintained in, uh, on an equitable level and that has been contentious uh, these have been contentious issues for both Ontario and Quebec excuse me Ontario and Alberta I should say also there's government policies such as multiculturalism uh, this is very has been very contentious specifically when it first came about there are many Canadians that feel that the policy and program of multiculturalism has actually weakened Canadian national identity and weakened its unity because it is basically supporting the basic uniqueness and individuality of different ethnic groups and that the sense of what is Canadian so to speak is weakened and and quite ambiguous also bilingualism has been a contentious program the fact that we have two official languages English and French and that both are supported throughout Canada within the federal government has uh, played a role as regards to challenges to national unity particularly in the West and another example of elements that or forces that have specifically challenged Canada's national unity has been Aboriginal self-determination we talked about that briefly as well the Aboriginal people believe that they have an inherent self-right to self-determination. In other words, they call, First Nations call themselves First Nations because they were actual nations that Canada had negotiated treaties with. And the Métis and the Inuit themselves as well feel that they have an, an inherent right to their own self-determination. In other words, the ability to determine their own affairs. And this definitely impacts the national unity of Canada. And it does so in a number of areas. For example, land claims. Uh, one group, the Nisga Agreement, which affirmed the Nisga people of BC their right to self-determination and gave them a huge tract of land. In fact, they control approximately 2,000 square miles in BC and so land claims and other claims for collective rights by Aboriginal groups have definitely impacted the national unity within Canada. Self-government as well. We see, for example, the Inuit people successfully negotiating and achieving an element of self-determination with the creation of Nunavut, a, a third territory which is basically governed by the Inuit people and so they have achieved an element of self-government and self-determination and this obviously has impacted Canada's national unity But let's consider Canada from the standpoint of the fact that it's an evolving place. In fact, maybe we can consider it or, or state uh, from the standpoint of the changing face of Canada. So how has Canada and its, the fact that it's changed and developed over time, how, is, how have these factors affected national unity? Well, let's consider immigration first. Well, it's important to note that Canada's foreign-born population, so those people who have immigrated to Canada who were not born here, has grown four times faster than the population of Canadians that were actually born here. So what we are seeing is an increase and in expansion in the population of a group of Canada which uh, came from another location. And so this obviously is going to impact quite dramatically the national identity of Canada and thus its national unity. And we can, when we consider immigration as well, it's important to note that currently close to 60% of the immigrants um, that are now coming and settling in Canada are now coming from Asia and not from traditional areas such as Europe. And that will also impact the national identity of the country and it will also impact its, its unity and its, na its national unity. Something else it's important to note that nearly 20% of the people, the immigrants that have settled in Canada, do not speak either English or French. And so they, have a, they do speak a language, but it's not one of the, the two official languages of communication, and that's obviously going to have an impact on national unity. How about urbanization? The process of a population or elements of a population moving from rural areas to urban areas or to cities and basically urbanization is the rise of cities well I had mentioned in a previous discussion that currently Canada's population is approximately 80 percent urban in other words 80 percent of the population live in city 
or metropolitan areas 